six years on from his first victory in Formula One, where he became the youngest race winner in history at just 18 years of age. Now 24 years of age, world champion Max Verstappen from P2 on the grid won the Spanish Grand Prix and now leads the world championship by six points. Welcome, everybody, to the Go F1 show. I'm your host, Matthew Marsh. Great to have you with us today for this debrief of round six of the 2022 Formula One World Championship. It's the 52nd World Championship Spanish Grand Prix. And later in today's show, very special, we've got uh, a chat with China's first F1 driver, Zhou Guanyu. That's exclusive, the chat with Zhou Guanyu. And indeed, it was also with the star of Drive to Survive and sometime team principal of the Haas F1 team, Gunter Steiner. So stay tuned for those exclusive discussions. And we're also having a tribute to the great, late great, Nicky Lauda. We'd love to hear your thoughts and memories of Nikki. So please do get in contact on social media using our handle at GoF1 Show. Rachel is at the social media control room. She's ready to hear from you. And let's go over straight away to the Sapung circuit or nearby for our co-host, my co-host, Alex Young. Alex, welcome uh, tonight. Spanish Grand Prix, not famous for being exciting, but today's was pretty good. Yeah, I mean, that was a really eventful Grand Prix. I really enjoyed it. You know, ebbed and flowed, quite a few surprises. And you're right, by um, Barcelona standards, it was a super exciting Grand Prix. And a special treat for everybody tonight. Not one, but in fact, two former F1 drivers and a Spanish one at that. Joining us tonight, actually now from the Mateki circuit in Japan, near to Tokyo, the 2015 Manor Marussia F1 driver, Roberto Mary, who was also the champion in 2011 of the Formula 3 Euro Series, competed in the Macau Grand Prix five times with the best result of fourth in 2014. He's in Japan now because he's competing in the Japanese Super GT Championship with Team Le Mans in this lovely Audi R8. Welcome, Roberto. What did you think of the Grand Prix? Hi to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I think the race was pretty excited, especially with the moment of uh, Carlos going out and also Max. And then the battle between Red Bulls and Russell was pretty exciting. And then to see the comeback from Lewis Hamilton was very, very good, I think. Very show interesting race. Then, yeah, it was a great race, I think, for, for a Spanish Grand Prix, as you mentioned. And it's great to have you with us. Thank you, Roberto. Plenty yeah. to talk about. Uh, today. And let's start off with a quick uh, recap. Let's have a look at what we think are the bullet points of the race today, well, Alex. Yes, of course. I mean, you know, at the very beginning, Verstappen trying to, to overtake, um, well, actually, first of all, Science and Verstappen going off and making mistakes into the grav traps. Um, but um, it was good to see um, Verstappen trying to fight back. Couldn't get past Russell, had those DRS issues. And then, of course, Leclerc in the lead by a mile then retired. Uh, and what was interesting then, of course, was the close switching strategies, going for three pit stops. Uh, Perez overtook Russell for P1. It looked like Perez was going to go on to win. Verstappen coming through towards the end as well. And um, team orders, you might have to say, let uh, Verstappen through for the win. And um, another Red Bull one too. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. Let's, before we dive into it, let's have a look mm. uh, at the results, the top 10 results uh, of, of today's Spanish Grand Prix. And here they are. Max Verstappen won the Grand Prix's head, a large margin, 13 seconds over his teammate, Sergio Perez, who did get the fastest lap. George Russell there, second podium of the season, showing Mercedes pace tonight. Carlos Sainz uh, from Ferrari is fourth, ahead of Lewis Hamilton, fifth, Valtteri Bottas, sixth, Esteban Ocon, seventh, Lando Norris, eighth, Fernando Alonso, ninth, and Yuki Tsunoda getting points for the third time this season with tenth. Let's start, gentlemen, by talking about the Red Bull drivers. And I want to go to you, Roberto, first of all. This is the 24th victory of Max Verstappen. Was it one of his best, do you think? Not really. I mean, obviously, the DRS denied him a better spectacle, I think, because he was not able to overtake Russell. And I think with DRS, obviously, he will overtake him because also you are changing the strategy of the of the electric power on the car and i am sure he was planning to overtake him and then when he had all the tools with like the battery using perfectly to overtake him then the DRS didn't work then all the effort on the previous lap didn't work at all no then also with his mistake at the beginning of the race going out 
into corner four, I think, you know, it was maybe not the best day of Max and even so he won the race. But uh, obviously Perez, I think he made a good race. Not really good yesterday on qualifying, as we saw, he was lacking a little bit of pace compared to Max because even Max didn't have the second chance on the Q3. Probably he could improve a little bit more his lap time. And then Perez was before behind both Ferraris and Max. And today I think he did a really good drive. Uh, since the beginning, he made a good start, overtaking Sainz. Uh, and then uh, he was uh, able to fight to overtake Russell straight away, no losing time. And obviously the mm. team asked him to let by Max, you know, the order. Obviously Max is the title contender, contender right now. And Perez is probably uh, not the first one from the team, but probably he can finish in the top three this year. I, I think Sergio has done a big step compared to the previous year. I think he's now much better, much confident with the car. And on the race, he's showing that he has the pace. You know, I think today he was able to win. Also in Arabia Saudi, without the safety car, he was able to win. And there is two races that he is already able to win with, let's say, no problems from Max. You know, then I yeah. think it's really, really strong this year. And if I, if I may just jump in a bit there, Matt, I, you know, I agree. I don't think... Yes, it was a great, it was a good Max Verstappen performance, but not one of his, you know, it wasn't extra special. What I thought was special was the Red Bull strategy. Um, you know, they couldn't overtake Russell, right? Stuck with the DRS. Every time they got even closer, the DRS didn't want to open. So I, I thought it was a really good change of strategy to go to three stop. You know, you could see that they, I don't think they wanted to do the three stop. And they got super aggressive with that, that three stop and um, went committed to it early. It reminded me a bit like, uh, what Ferrari used to do in the early noughties with uh, Schumacher and Braun, you know, it's quite often when they were getting stuck behind people, they'd go to an aggressive three stop, even a four stop, if I remember correctly. And mm. uh, I love that aggression from the Red Bull team. Um, and that was quite cool to watch. In the end, the three stop was faster, but they were the first ones to, to commit to it, go, right, let's go for that and uh, see if we can make it work. Um, don't you think, Alex, that the DRS problem that they had on Max's car in qualifying yesterday, that basically stopped him even having a shot at pole and in the race today. I mean, as you say, it forced them into a three-stop that could have gone wrong for them. Not really what a world championship team should be having at this stage, no? Yeah, uh, a bit of a strange one. You know, it's so delicate. Uh, it's such fine margins, really, isn't it? Such fine margins with the tolerances and stuff that um, they couldn't just put another one on. Um Obviously, Perez was working fine. It wasn't a problem that just cropped up today on the run to the grid. It was something that happened in qualifying. So, uh, yeah, Verstappen, you know, obviously he was pretty angry with that. But, um, you know, it, it's in Formula 1, you're dealing with such fine tolerances. The build quality is very important. And, and they just couldn't quite fix it, could they? That's the th uh, it troubles me because, um, and I'm going to ask you, Roberto, about Sergio being annoyed, being asked to give up the lead. And I was surprised by that because to me, it's obvious that Sergio is the number two driver there and he's been hired to help Max win. Why would he be angry? I mean, first of all, going back to the DRS of Max, I think, you know, the engineer told him to, to stay away from the curbs in the exit of the last corner. And then uh, I think also, if, if you notice, he was having the problem when he was closer to Russell than when he was far, when he was maybe... Nine tenths, he was able to open the DRS when he was half a second, he was not. And I think it's due also to the turbulence of the car in front that is really uh, heavy in Formula One. And I think that also could affect the system. You know, I don't know why they didn't say to him to try to go maybe to the right side and open the DRS, you know, to take, take cleaner. Maybe that will work. I don't know. I mean, it, it seems to me like uh, it happened only when he was really close to Russell. And when he was a bit far, it didn't really happen that often, you know. And yeah, and going back to what you say, I think he was a bit unhappy with the decision of Red Bull uh, when he asked to to Max to let him by to overtake Russell and not not losing time. Then Red Bull didn't let him by until Max beat. And I think mm -hmm. that was why he was so upset. You know, it's like you don't help me, and now I need to help you. You know, it's like, uh, come on, we are a team. Help me, and then I will help you when you're gonna ask me. You know, I think Sergio has been really helpful to the team. You know, in in considering he always let Max, and then in in Abu Dhabi making sure Hamilton was losing time. You know, but this time I think it was just a bit uh, upset. You know, with this with the situation that happened before. 
Yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I don't disagree with you, Roberto. I just think it's just odd to me that drivers who are quite obviously number twos, and there's no disrespect, they're you know race winning and they're with a championship yeah, yeah. team. Mm. And they, is it like Rubens Barrichello had that at, at Ferrari, he was hired to be to ride shotgun to Michael Schumacher. And then he'd have a good mm. few good performances and he'd get really upset and, you know, finally left the team because he thought he could do better elsewhere. And I think that it's a it's mm. troubling to me that Sergio wasn't totally understanding. Anyway, let's move on to um let's talk about Ferrari briefly, <laughs> which is odd to say for a team that was leading the world championship until about 24 hours ago, mm. I suppose. Um first of all, reliability problems for Ferrari, Alex. Yeah, um, bit of a surprise, wasn't that? Uh, well, it's going to happen though. You know, Max has had two retirements now, and I suppose it's Leclerc, Leclerc's turn. Uh, but I'm very disappointed though. You know, Leclerc looked so good, didn't he? I mean, there were so many parts of this of this race. I guess this is the the end of the first major part of the race. Uh, out in front, um, looked like he was looking after those tires really well. You know, so he thought, okay, he's a shoe in for the win because it didn't. You know, Ferrari had brought a lot of upgrades to this race, and it looked like they weren't killing those front front outside tires like it has the last couple of races. So I thought that was good progress. I thought Leclerc, Leclerc's attitude was excellent as well, the way he talked about it. He's like, yeah, I'm going to lose the championship, but that's not important. What's important is that we are making progress. You know, the updates seemed to be working. The race pace was good. I was not killing the outside front tire. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that bodes well for the future. Hmm. And... Roberto, you're a Spanish Formula One driver, so let's talk about Carlos Sainz <laughs> and the mistake he made into turn. Not a very good start. anti store kicked in off the start line, dropped down that. He lost the position to George Russell, didn't he, off the start line? And then, and he was on the clean side of the track, I think, wasn't he? Let me just have a quick check here. Yeah, he was third on the grid. Yeah. And then yeah. lap seven off the track at turn four. Oof, there it is. I I think about the the mistake in to corner four in lap seven. Uh, I think it was a bit due to the to the win in these cars. You know, the win is really effective because we saw to Carlos and we saw like to Carlos. You can say okay, he's struggling this year with the car to to be you know quick and and not making mistakes because he's quick, but sometimes he makes mistakes this year in the car. But the Max, we don't normally see mistakes from Max, and it happened exactly the same to Max and to Carlos. Then, for me, it was something special on that corner on the race that the that it was tricky. I don't know if the win or maybe mm. some oil or whatever that the both of them lose the car in the same way. But obviously, on the start, I think Carlos this year is having really poor starts. I don't see him winning any position in any start this year so far. And I think uh, it's something that he needs to work with Ferrari because he is not confident. I know in Australia he had an issue with the steering wheel because they just changed the steering wheel before the start due to a problem. And then the steering wheel they give to him, it was with completely different settings to the one he had for the start and he had a poor start in Australia because of that. And now look like a little bit the same problem, but not ex not as big, you know, and... But he's struggling a lot on the starts. He needs to work on, on the starts to do something, to speak with the team, to try to find a solution. Because it's not yeah. normal to see him uh, making bad starts because normally he was really good in the starts in the Spanish Grand Prix. Then I will not say it's due to pressure, but uh, but probably this weekend was his uh, worst weekend this year so far because the race was not good. The, the, the lap time was also mm. not so competitive. And I'm, I think it's a little bit of work to do there. You know, uh, he was good in Tokyo mm -hmm. 2. He was good in the first set of Q3, but not in, not didn't improve on the second one so much. Then I think it's a little bit of work to do there and to try to, to get all the details working because I think it's just about the small details to put it together and, and to make sure they are able to, to work together. You know, I know this year so far he's struggling a little bit with the car with like, his confidence, he's not confident. Like last year, he was able to do whatever he wants with the car. I mm. think the car is driving him around. It's not him driving <laughs> the car. And then I think it's... <laughs> no, but it's, it's sometimes happened to the drivers, eh? to many of us. Like uh, yeah. sometimes you don't feel like you can do whatever you want with the car. So, you know, for example, when I won the F3, I was doing one with the car. But uh, sometimes I was quick, but the car was driving me, you know? <laughs> 
And I think it's something like that what is happening to Carlos, you know. I think he needs to get the confidence on the car to get back. And I am sure, you know, Carlos has something special, something good that he learns very quick. And he's a guy that if you see all his year, he's improving through the year, you know. He's yeah. he's always stronger the second part of the year than the first part. And hopefully he will make that pole and he will win his first race soon. <laughs> I hope it's soon Let's because hope. Mercedes, Let's hope. Mercedes is already there and it's another two yeah. cars that he needs to fight. That's very true. Mm. Speaking of Mercedes, let's talk about them because driver of the day yeah. today, as voted by the fans, here it is, Lewis Hamilton. Mm. What do you think about that, Alex? Uh, yeah, can I go for this? Um, go. I was super excited by this. I mean, first of all, let's talk about his teammate um, because um, Russell was great, great battle with this happened. But Hamilton. That was a really special drive, you know. Um, it's these sort of drives which make you kind of go, wow, okay, you know, this is where he's really special. Sometimes it's not the world titles that make it so special when he's got such a big car advantage. It's these sort of drives. Um, first, you know, he was super negative at the very beginning, said he wanted to stop and stuff because save the engine and stuff, which is <laughs> As you not, being not sarcastic a bad idea. Yeah. On Twitter, right? <laughs> yeah, I am being sarcastic. Yeah, yeah. But, but his pace after that, I I never would have expected that. Don't forget, this was a safety car free race. Yeah. Um, and he pitted, had to put on new tires, just changed the, le the, the left hand side, put softs on, didn't go to hards or mediums. So he would have got out of that pit lane. He would have been 30, 40 seconds off the back of the grid, not yeah. off the front. That's a huge gap. And um, he got to within 12 seconds of his teammate. Ah, uh, no safety cars. Got to within 12 seconds of his teammate. I, I want to see the highlight reel of his laps. I would love to watch the onboards for that whole race. Good point. 54 seconds from... off the leader, yeah. Roberto, sorry. sorry. Tell us. It, pro probably if you take the the time from lap uh, three to lap two, two last laps to the end because uh, he had the issue, he he was the quickest, you know, from lap two to, to lap uh, 64, I will say. He was the quickest yeah. from that period to that period because, uh, as Alex mentioned, yeah. he was uh, very far behind the leader. And at that point, maybe he was only around 30 seconds behind uh, Verstappen. It's a very good point. And he ended yeah, up 54 really, seconds off. You're right. We're going to have to do that. Alex is going to yeah. do his homework overnight. He's going to stay up all night <laughs> and give us a full report in the morning on Twitter of every lap time good. compared to the <laughs> good of you, Alex. Speaking of Twitter, we've just yeah, seen that no the first message we've seen from our fans on the screen was, in fact, from our co-host Alex Jung to at GoF1 Show on Twitter. But, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to chip in with any comments and questions yeah. you might have. We'd love to hear from you. Um, so, Lewis Hamilton had three stops. So did George Russell. We mustn't forget George now six times. He's finished in the top five in the first six races, of course. Only person to do that. Um, had yesterday Mercedes strongest qualifying of the season when he uh, qualified fourth mm. so fantastic performance from the 24 year old and i i yeah i'm totally with you it, it does feel like um of those bringing the upgrades it's mercedes that has come out on top and there's various of course ferrari um mm -hmm. mclaren obviously did a load as well aston martin will get on to um but do you think that's right alex that yeah. mercedes had the best of the upgrades yeah um yeah but it's not just the upgrades they brought it's the fact that they can they now understand what's happening you know because they were trying some things and they couldn't stop the porpoising so that was the first thing that they had to fix so now that they've got that under control right you know the the new skirt you see the this the on the outside edge of the floor um they look like they've put some aluminium skirts there or something um to stiffen that floor and that seems to have helped a lot so now they can focus on performance parts and you are going to see a huge ramp up um and the, every update they they bring for the next few races is, is going to have good advantage good um good steps forward and um you know mercedes historically have always been strong in the middle part of the season uh mm -hmm. in the, when we're in, in all the european races and i think that's what's going to happen again and i wouldn't be surprised if we see them winning in, in not very long time well let's hope well, I a number of teams brought upgrades, as I mentioned, and there was a bit of controversy uh, when we saw unveiled the new uh, Aston Martin, which had a bit of a similarity, one could say, to the uh, to the Red Bull car. Um, and the person to speak to about these things is the technical expert in Formula One, Craig Scarborough. And I caught up with him 
uh, a little bit uh, before the race and, and asked him, what did, what did you make, Scarbs, of this controversy? What has come from Red Bull? And the, the thing is, we, none of us can answer that. Now, we know that the teams are very strict in taking data from one team to another, uh, both in terms of teams not letting data out of their building, but equally the other teams not wanting it to come in, whether it's in digital or paper format, it really just has to come in, in the designers' heads. So, I mean, I think this is a bit of a storm in a teacup because when you do look at it in detail, there's only about three or four surfaces that are very similar. Lots mm. of other bits like the undercut, the uh, front of the side pods, other aspects of the car are completely different. But to be honest, if I was an engineer going from one team to another, it wouldn't be the side pod design that I would take the data for. It would be, you know, um, statistics of you know the the targets of downforce and drag they were in for the shape of the underfloor um you know bits of software that help you design things stuff like that it wouldn't be the side pod top because that really doesn't give you that much performance as we've seen from the aston martin already this weekend in barcelona storm in a teacup i don't know roberta whether you know what that means it's a british kind of slang phrase that basically i think scarb says he doesn't think he doesn't think that Aston Martin stole designs from Red Bull. What do you think? Well, <laughs> it's a bit uh, <laughs> similar to the Red Bull when you see it now, you know. But uh, yeah. but obviously there is a lot of things. I mean, the most important thing I will see in a race car is the front wing because uh, the air is getting cut by the front wing and then it's going through the car. And then for me, you know, even if you copy the rest of the car, if the front wing is different, then you, you have different uh, flow of the airflow through the car. Then it's really important to make sure the front wing is pretty similar to copy the rest of the car, you know. If you have a different, if you throw the air through the front wing differently, yeah. it's complicated to copy the rest, you know. It's like it, it doesn't work. So what are you saying? Because, because you obviously... I, 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 obviously, I was with my obviously with my team. I say, why we don't copy the, the Mercedes? You know, just copy the car. Don't yeah. don't try to do. It. And they say, no, we need to copy everything. The front wing is especially, and then the rest. You know, it will come. But they say it, it, it doesn't work like that. So simple. <laughs> Alex. Mm. Yeah, so I mean, it the... is. It, it's it, it's very. If they had all the drawings and stuff like. We could argue one certain team did with the Mercedes, what was it, two years ago. Um, it makes sense. But it is very difficult to go down that path where you try and copy people because you don't understand why they do these things. You don't understand what has led them to, to go with these designs. And if you don't understand the concept, then you're probably going to get it wrong. Um, and if it's just Aston Martin looking, hey, that's quite a clever thing that they've got there. Why don't we use that? Oh, it works in the wind tunnel. Let's put that in. That's one thing. You know, but if you're saying that it's, there's actually espionage going on and someone's stealing secrets, then that's obviously another thing, and and that's that's very hard to prove as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on. We've talked about Red Bull winning. We talked about Ferrari breaking down. We've talked about Mercedes improving. Let's talk about actually improvements. Let's let's have a look at the race performance chart now and see. There it is. Fernando Alonso at age forty-one uh, made up. What do you make up? 11 places to finish in yeah. ninth. Uh, pretty impressive. Esteban Ocon, his teammate, fifth. So it looks like, Alex, that the Alpine cars uh, are pretty yeah. strong, at least in race pace. Yeah. Not made very qualifying. Yeah. I, I've actually been thinking that for a few races now. I've actually been thinking that Alpine looks really good. Um, much better than the results he's been getting. And, and you know, Lance has been in a couple of good positions, which he just hasn't been in a sometimes a bit unlucky. Uh, but I think it's a dark horse, the RP. And, and if they can start showing that pace and getting it right in qualifying and converting those races, that race pace to actual fulfilling their full potential, this car could be um, really, really rapid and, and it could be the best of the rest after the big three. Um, so look out, you know, I, I think um, operationally, they just obviously got to get things a little bit better. But once they do, I think they're going to be flying. Yeah. So I've got to ask you, Roberto, about your fellow Spaniard, Fernando Alonso. So is he somebody that you did you ever work with him? Was he an inspiration to you? What's your relationship with Fernando? Uh, yeah, Fernando is a bit of a special character, as you know. I mean, obviously, so many years in the Formula One, everybody knows him a little bit. 
And uh, didn't work with him, to be honest. Obviously, I met him a couple of times. We spoke, but uh, nothing special. I invited him to do a karting race together, but he was not able to to, to work. That he had to go uh, actually to to Alpine to close the deal with them. And uh, and yeah, I mean, he, I think he's doing okay performance this year. He's doing a step compared to last year. Last year he was struggling, especially at the beginning of the year. At the end, he was better. And now uh, it's a bit unlucky with the, the the results because I think he's not in the championship when he will deserve to be. I mean, Alpine, as as you mentioned, has a a good car for racing, but he's not able to solve Fernando due to problems, retirements. Uh, he's not able to to take points. I think he has three, four points so far. Maybe three, no? Now mm. and uh, four. Uh, he's, he's four, no? But yeah, nine today, two points. It's not where he should be, you know. Uh, obviously, he's still fit, even if he's 41 years old. And I think he, he can be fighting for being between P6 and P10 in the championship. I think that will be more real for him now. Right. Well, let's hope. Fingers crossed for Fernando Alonso. We've had a, a question in from our audience um, about Valtteri Bottas, I think. Thank you, Anton. Great conversation. I agree. Wondering why no team considered using the hard tyres in this race and would, very good question, would Valtteri have finished higher uh, than the sixth place he did finish in? Of course, he started seventh, finished sixth, if the team had opted for hard tyre strategy. What do you mm. think, Alex? What was the reason for that? Um, good question uh, from the, the, obviously, obviously, the hard tyre, I don't think, was quick enough. And to be honest, the soft tyre lasted really well. Um, you know, that, that three-stop strategy, short pit lane in Barcelona, really seemed to work quite well. I, and, and to be honest, I think Bottas was on its way to be driver of the day if they hadn't gone and converted to a three-stop strategy. I was a little bit surprised because it, about halfway through the race, you could see the pace of the softs and more and more teams are switching to the three-stop strategy. And, um, you know, Alfa Romeo had, I think, 20-second gap. Okay, he had Sainz and he had uh, Hamilton closing in on him. But after that, it was a good twenty over 20-second gap. So... I, I feel it was worth it. I think it was, was a safe thing to have gone for a three stop, um, and and it, it turned out to be that that case because a two stop meant there's no way he could have kept Science and uh, Hamilton behind him. Mm. Difficult, but good good race. It's almost sl slightly under a cloud. Uh, clouds the wrong word. He's in the shade, is what I mean to say. Maybe it's related to clouds because Val Valtteri's kind of he's there. He's running fourth, fifth, sixth, and then we don't notice him yeah. until you know a few laps from the end, like with Miami. He suddenly loses two places yeah. uh, towards the end of the race. Yeah. Let's talk about his uh, his teammate at Alfa Romeo. Unfortunately, Joe Guan Yu had his second success, successive retirement, um, but we did catch up with him just before this weekend, and uh, he's turning 23 years of age next week. He's the first, of course, and only Chinese driver ever in Formula 1, so great interest to us on the Go F1 show. And um, he's had three seasons in Formula 2, five wins there, um, we had this exclusive conversation with him earlier in the week. Do you have a particular kind of target or ambition this year? Well, I had a target before the season, but unfortunately I already reached that. So I have to do another step up because uh, yeah, my target originally was trying to go Q2 and then trying to finish in the points. So we done that in the first round. But then, yeah, I think now I want to be fighting for q3 if it's possible but then race for sure is always fighting for the points because i feel like uh, you know even though we don't have a perfect saturday we can have a much better sunday because the race pace for myself seems to be a lot more stronger than one lap pace just i think a pure confidence of how much i can push in quality so yeah it was a great chat with joe we've obviously known him alex and i since he was in Formula 3, and he's a great guy, really interesting conversation, which you can, obviously that's just a short snippet today, but you can catch uh, all of it, actually, or most of it, um, on our YouTube channel, which is very easy to find. You basically go to YouTube, obviously, and you search Go F1 Show, and there you can see there's a whole host of content, uh, what we're calling bonus content. We can't obviously cover everything in our live shows, but there's a whole host of stuff there for you, and we encourage you to go to it. So just search Go F1 Show uh, within youtube let's talk about joe he's had some good results of course scored points as he said that he's had to kind of reevaluate what his target is having finished 10th in his first grand prix and then 11th 11th 15th and then two dnfs um roberto what do you think of him
he did a really impressive first race. I think he was able to get points. But I think he's struggling a little bit with Formula 1 and F2. I think he was doing a very good job. He was really competitive, especially on the race, very intelligent, driving, not making mistakes, always going forward on the race. But in F1, he's still, I mean, lacking a little bit of speed compared to Valtteri, I think around half a second, more or less. And I think uh, Alfa Romeo has a very strong car this year. And I think he needs some, some races to get used to the car and to be able to to put his potential out there, you know, because he, at the moment, I think he's struggling. He started very strong on the first race, but I think uh, he needs kilometers on the car and to, to do more laps to be able to to drive the car, you know, and to be able to to be quicker. I think he is not half a second slower than Valtteri as, as he's showing. He's just lacking maybe confidence at the moment on the car and probably he will be up to speed by the end of the year. Well, another person who had a pretty disappointing uh, weekend is Gunter Steiner. We're going to be hearing from him after this very short break and also a tribute to the late, great Nicky Loud. But first of all, a check-in with our friends at WebEx. Who's got the best fans? That's a very good question. Let's put up a poll. Come on, England. Ciao. Alieri. Look who's got the best fans. Yes! With WebEx, the McLaren F1 team and their fans are competing like never before. <laughs> WebEx, driving hybrid work. Welcome back, everybody, to the Go F1 show with myself, Matthew Marsh. We've got special guest, uh, Roberto Mary, joining us from Mategi in Japan and Alex Jung from Sepang in Malaysia. And a quick reminder to you mm. that uh, the Spanish Grand Prix was won by uh, Max Verstappen. He now leads the World Drivers' Championship by six points. Let's, in fact, let's have a look at the uh, driver's standings. Here it is. Max jumps into the lead. Alex, talk about what you think is relevant yeah. here or important. Interesting. Well, I look at that and, yeah, it's, yeah, it's great to see Max in the lead. Good for him. Um, super close between those two. And it looks like it's a two-horse race at the moment. But I want to go a bit further down, look at the guys in fourth and sixth, George Russell and Carlos and, and Lewis Hamilton. You know, after what I've seen today from Mercedes, maybe not Monaco, but uh, the race after that or the race uh, just after that, perhaps, I think Mercedes are really going to start becoming a force. And uh, just wondering, you know, what, what are they? It's um, 30 and 50 points off the lead. Is that too big? Or do you think um, those Mercedes drivers could become a factor in the championship this year? You know, it's twenty yeah. a lot of races this year. It is possible, isn't it? It's a very good question. We we've just actually passed the quarter distance of the championship at this round, uh, and it's a good question, Roberto. Do you think the Mercedes drivers could be a factor in the drivers' championship? Mm. I think they they can be, but they probably not winning. I think Verstappen now is a bit ahead, and I think Mercedes will be there. But it will not be stronger than Red Bull. I think they will come to speed, maybe same as Red Bull, same as Ferrari. But I don't think they're going to have that uh, superiority that they had on the past, that they were able to win one, two, and the other were miles behind. And right. then that's why I think it's very hard to, 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 to get that many points from Verstappen, you know, especially after so many races. Normally, they will not have more technical issues as before, because obviously at the beginning of the year, you have technical issues due to a new car uh, obviously with kilometers you are trying to to solve those problems and it's what red bull is doing and i think uh, mercedes is gonna be there as alex yeah. mentioned but uh, probably same speed as the others i don't think they're gonna right. be quick then i don't think they're gonna be winning the championship maybe okay. p3 in the championship p2 yes but winning i think is a bit too, too much, much. Too much. Okay. Well, what was too much, unfortunately, was what our friend Gunter Steiner was hoping for this weekend. He was very clear about it coming into this weekend. We had a chat uh, before he set off for Barcelona where he said that the target was points. Let's hear a little bit more from Haas team principal Gunter Steiner. Spanish Grand Prix coming up. What do you expect of that race for your team and drivers? Points. <laughs> A simple stage, no. No, no, I mean, it's, I think we now need to uh, capitalize and we have got a good car. We, need, we need, just need to capitalize and not make uh, mistakes. And then uh, I think points should be coming, you know. That is what we have to do. Fantastic. 
always entertaining, mm -hmm. Gundersteiner. And again, the full interview is, is on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to take a look. So Kevin Magnussen qualified eighth, finished 17th. Of course, had that clash with Lewis Hamilton on that one. Michael, uh, okay. Max, sorry, Mick Schumacher qualified 10th, finished 14th. Alex, disappointing. Mm. Yeah, mm. very disappointing. Um, I don't know. I'm not really sure what happened with Schumacher. Um, had a bit of a... a so was, we were focusing so much on the battle at the front, so I didn't really see what happened with him. I didn't know if they made the wrong course strategy or the pace wasn't quite there. Uh, got a feel for Magnussen, though, you know. Um, you know, he was he was out of the race after that first lap, wasn't he? Uh, and he really struggled to make any inroads after that. But um, from what I could see the live t time screens at the time, there wasn't mega pace from the Haas. So there'd be a bit of head scratching there. And we've seen that that from the, this year already. They're not always quick. You know, there've been some some races like, um, where was it? I think it was Miami, where they just disappeared and stuff. Um, and yeah. some, especially the early races in the season where they were firmly in the top 10. So definitely a bit of head scratching going on over there. So sadly, no points for Haas uh, this weekend. Let's look at the constructor standings to see uh, where Haas end up, because of course, with the victory today, these boys, Red Bull Racing, now leapfrog uh, into the lead ahead of Ferrari. There it is, unfortunately, Haas uh, down in eighth place. Um, Roberto, what do you think about the Constructors' Championship? Anything that stands out from you for you there of those teams? No, I think it's pretty no After what we have shown on the see on the testing, I think it's pretty normal. I mean, McLaren obviously start really but the year, especially Bahrain, I think we were all surprised about the poor performance of McLaren. Even then, they were a bit uh, surprised. And I think, yeah, I mean, obviously Ferrari is struggling now for victories, as at the beginning of the year looked like they had a big superiority. And now I would say it's Red Bull a little bit on top of Ferrari. And, and obviously, I think the results are normal, nothing, nothing special there. Yeah. Well, let's look at this. Red Bull Racing used to be Jaguar Racing. And at one point, Nicky Lauda was involved with that team as a consultant. Ferrari, two world championships were won by Nicky Lauda. Um, who's third in the world championship? Mercedes. Mercedes. Of course, it was, it was Nicky <laughs> that turned them around. McLaren is where Nicky won his third world championship. That's quite a good segue into, I think, a conversation I had last weekend. <laughs> tremendous conversation. Uh, with the great journalist and author, Morris Hamilton, who told us what he misses most about the three-time world champion. You know, as you know, Nicky's English is very quick, very clip, very different. Blah, blah, blah. You know, he speaks, blah, blah. It's a different way. And you, this, by the way, you need to do... I want to hear more of that. A couple of times now you've done a little bit of Nicky. I want to hear you describe... Well, all, you, you, you have all the tape, all the time, listening to them in your ear, and in the end you end up speaking like this, you see, because you know how he talks. When you look back at drivers, uh, Matthew, people tend to talk about, was he the greatest? And they look at their records and achievements. And when that's been done, in the case of Nicky, he, he tends to be ignored. He's not mentioned in the greats, is he? He, he, wasn't, he isn't mentioned in, in dispatches as, as you know, the, one of the all-time greats, but he was, because he won 25 Grand Prix. And... You know, he was a multiple world champion. God, what a legend. Now, this is the book that Morris wrote. I do encourage you, everybody, to, to read it, and um, you won't regret it. And I want to ask our, our um, steam colleagues on the show, Roberto, first of all, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Any thoughts on Nikki? Did you ever meet Nikki, or are you too young to have met Nikki Lauda? <laughs> yeah, when I was in Mercedes as junior driver and DTM driver, uh, Nicky was coming sometimes to some race. And what I will say, he was a very determined person. He knows what he wanted and he was really straightforward with, with us. But uh, obviously I was maybe too young to, obviously I was not even born to see his racing. But uh, after I saw obviously the, the film Rush, I saw so many documentaries and for sure he was a really clever person and he knew what he wanted and that's, I think, the key of his success, no? Because he was a guy that he was, if he wanted something, he was going for it and he was, whatever it cost him, he will, he will get it. So, Alex, with younger fans like Roberto, the young generation, they know of Nicky as a guy who's turned teams around. But you and I, and you're obviously still much younger than I am, 
we we think of him perhaps as a race driver and the, the way he came into the sport. And I'm, you know, did you take inspiration from yeah. Nicky at all? Well, yes, I'm I'm a lot younger than you. Thank you for noticing. Um, <laughs> so uh, I never I never watched him in the seventies like you did, uh, but I, I did obviously watch him in the eighties. You know, and, and when he came back and, and he won that world title in eighty four. Um, after retiring, you know, and and he was always very clever, wasn't he, with his driving, with what he's going to do, always thinking ahead. Um, you know, he he wasn't a match for Prost that year, was he? He was didn't have the pace uh, of of the younger, up and start French driver at that time. But um, you know, he still won that world title, you know, and uh, that, you know that was he retired after that. Um, but yeah, and, and of course, you know, what happened to him in, in the Nurburgring when he. With that, with that big accent and the way he came back the following year, it's all you know, fantastic stuff, fairy tale mm. stuff, really, and shows the grit and determination of the man. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. two things: I had a great chat with Morris, and actually, when Chris Coe, who's our team manager here on the Go F One show, listened to the raw interview, he said, "We just got to put that whole thing up. It's ten minutes." But if you enjoy listening to people who know what they're talking about, and by which I mean not me, but Morris Hamilton speaking about Nikki Lauda. It's on our YouTube channel. And we asked people to submit their thoughts about Nikki this week. And uh, here's one that came in from a friend of the Go F1 show, another person who knows a lot about Formula One, Mark Gallagher, who will actually be joining us next week, just revealing that for the Monaco Grand Prix show. Here it is, Mark saying, as Morris says, there's much to the Nikki Lauda story. And, of course, part of it is the Lauda Air story, which you can read all about. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Morris's book, and uh, and specifically, as he says, Nikki's approach to the investigation and ensuring that Boeing took responsibility. So thank you very much to Mark for his comments there. Mm. I think uh, my own memories of Nikki are, I mean, there's so many, right, because we saw him racing this, but the key thing was when we were working on location with Fox very often, and we were, and we were trying to sort of, how do I answer the question that's going to be coming? And the answer was, ah, oh, there's Nikki over there. And you didn't need to book Nikki. In fact, even if you tried to book Nikki for an mm. interview, you know, all the teams like to manage the drivers with the interviews, which is fine, by the way, we're not complaining. But in the case of Nikki, you just <laughs> basically waited outside the Mercedes motorhome and said, Nikki, you've got a minute. Yeah, of course. And then he would answer the question in a very direct and straightforward manner, which made great entertainment. Mm. So mm, yeah. Nikki louder. Mm. Absolutely. Okay. So, Roberto, I want to say thanks very much to you. I know you've got a lot going on. What are you up to in Mateki and what's going on this week? We have a test tomorrow, actually, in Motegi with the Formula car, uh, together with Team Le Mans. And I'm going to test a car to, to give my, my recommendation to the engineers and to the team in which way this will work, because obviously they have a... Rookie drivers and they want someone the, with a bit of experience with Formula cars. And then I always enjoy driving Formula cars. I think it's much more fun than a GT car. <laughs> and, and I love it. And then new track for me. And I think it's going to be fun. Uh, I am here then after this test. I will go to Chutuka for the race this weekend, Super GT race. Right. A great circuit. I, I haven't done many laps there, but, uh, but I know it's very nice, the circuit. Okay. And great atmosphere also, Super GT, the, the the public is amazing. You cannot imagine how many people is coming. It's like a Formula One race, I would say, a good one. And nothing here. And then I will go back to Spain after the race in Suzuka uh, for two months. And then I will come back to Japan. I mean, fantastic. Having, having a good time here in Japan, good food, <laughs> cycling a lot. Good, and then, good racetrack. I mean, good <laughs> Exactly. Good race tracks and good place yeah. to be. Fantastic. It's great to have had great. you on the show tonight. Really appreciate your time, Roberto. We'll let you get some sleep ahead of Thank the testing you so much. tomorrow. And, Thank you uh, so much. It, it was a pleasure Roberto. to stay here with, yeah. with you. See you. See you, Matthew. See you, Alex. Bye-bye. Good night. See you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Before we move on, Alex, a quick mention mm -hmm. again about our, our YouTube channel. I'm mentioning it again because we just got so much on there. We couldn't fit into mm -hmm. the show. We've obviously... Had uh, talked about Joe Guan Yu and Gunter Steiner and Morris Hamilton, but we've also uh, had a chat earlier this week with with Zach Brown, talking to him and Alejandro Agag about McLaren's entry uh, into Formula E. And we also spoke to the up and coming, well, actually, he's up and came uh, <laughs> Indian driver Formula Two, uh, Jahan Daruvana, who's had a pretty torrid time, unfortunately, 
uh, in Barcelona this weekend. But um, great interviews, plural with him, that you better get on our YouTube channel. So just a shout out for that. And coming up next week, uh, IndyCar star and McLaren testing driver, Colton Herter will be there as well. So plenty to talk about. Alex, Ooh. let's just, before we say goodbye to mm. our viewers today, let's just look ahead at what's coming up on the 2022 calendar. Only going to be 22 races. We heard that the Russian Grand Prix is not going to be replaced. What do you think about that, first of yeah. all? Uh, I think for a lot of people in the F1 paddock, they're probably quite happy. You know, there's a lot of races packed into the season. Uh, but yes, I mean, you know, Verstappen winning in Spain, big coup for Red Bull. And then they got the the extra bonus that Ferrari didn't finish. Leclerc didn't finish. However, however Monaco, I think, is going to be a Ferrari track. I think Leclerc is going to strike back there. But look at that, Baku, Montreal, Silverstone, and then Austria, Spielberg. Those four tracks are made for Red Bull right now. And uh, i got to say, Red Bull are going to be licking their lips, looking at that calendar. And uh, I think they're, they're going to be quite comfortable in the position that they are, leading both the Drivers' and Constructors' Championship. Fantastic. Licking their lips indeed will be Red Bull Racing. Mm. That's all we've got time for today, ladies and gentlemen. My great thanks, to, of course, to Roberto Mary over there in Mategi in Japan. And, of course, as ever. Yep to Alex Jung in Malaysia. We'll see you next week. Yeah. Bye.